that instead of trying to let go of my impatience with everything, I am more successful if I practice letting go of little things as they arise. You know, instead of doing the big, the big picture, if I just let go of little things. So it, it called for me to lighten up about a lot of things that I, I was um, very uptight about and very impatient about. And to say, as, as there's a book that says, don't sweat the small stuff. And it's all small stuff, really, when you boil it down and look at things in the, you know, from the cosmic point of view. So I had to loosen my grip on things and relax my inclination to try and control everything in my world. And I spoke on the first Sunday about people who say, you know, um, instead of saying, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, as they listen to the still small voice, they say, listen, Lord, thy servant speaketh. You know, I, we pray, but we tell God how we want it to happen. Don't we? Because there's a little control freak in all of us, you know, that we want it our way and we want it to come this way. If you try to control every aspect of life, you'll find yourself being dragged hither, thither, and yon in an exhausting, never-ending struggle to be on top of everything all the time. Sounds familiar to you? So the first step in learning to let go successfully is to acknowledge all the ways in which we cling to old behaviors, beliefs, and ways of being. And some people just say, I can't help it, I saw a mistake. If you attended our New Year workshop on January 7th, you would have written the things you want to let go of in the denial step of the affirmative prayer format we use for radical goals this year. But if you weren't here or you haven't done this, spend a few minutes today quietly noting all the feelings habits, tendencies, and outworn ideas that no longer serve you. You may be amazed at how tightly you cling to habitual ways of being in the world. Regularly focusing on old regrets and grudges and repeatedly indulging in stories of how you were hard done by. We love to dine out on those stories, you know. The, the, our, I call it our, our favorite bad feelings. You know, we, we regurgitate them. And favorite bad feelings, like favorite good feelings, are addictive. When you feel them, you th it means that you're thinking about the, th the old stories, and that makes your body generate certain chemicals which are addictive. You need more of it to feel more of the bad feelings. It's the same thing with good feelings. When you think good thoughts and thoughts of love and, and happiness and joy, your body secretes those chemicals, and you need more and more of those to feel better and better and better. So you get onto that merry-go-round. Uh, on one hand, the negative. On the other hand, are the things that make you really happy. So you see, on, all, on some level, we're all repeating self-destructive patterns in our lives. One woman told me that she's forever entering into relationships with unfaithful partners. And I wonder, you know, what is it that she's holding on to that allows her to repeat this unwanted experience? Could it be a view of herself as being unworthy? In addition, you know, after talking with her for a while, it became clear that she was holding on to a deep-seated fear of being alone. And so I wondered then, could it be that she was willing to tolerate almost anything just to have someone for company? I ha I've been working with her, and she's been working on, on putting down the fear and replacing it with love for herself. And... We're working on that. It, but she, she really says, I find it really hard to let go of that deep-seated, wow, what happens if it's me one? Uh, it, you know. So people, people who have that, that fear, it keeps coming up, you know? From time to time, it pops up. And that's when, if you are on the spiritual path, you, and this is where I think the journal that we're asking you to, uh, to, to keep this year becomes very useful because you can write it out. And if in writing it out, you get in touch with those feelings and it helps to, uh, to help you to let them go. So how many people are journaling? Can I just see? Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, it's, it's really a very worthwhile practice. Um, it's a worthwhile practice for people with codependency issues as well. Um, who have trouble letting go of the tendency to overprotect loved ones. And they often resort, codependence, to nagging, 
arguing or manipulation in their attempts to hold on. They need to learn that letting go in a relationship doesn't mean loving less. And that's, I want parents to take a note of that because we tell ourselves so often, it's because we love them and we want the best for them. And we know what's best for them, uh, uh, you know, for the children, for the youngsters. But we need to practice letting go and remind ourselves that the same intelligence that created us and that saw us through life is also operating in our children and in, in, in our loved ones. It, uh, uh, that had fits uh, people in this audience. Yes, we need to just remember that we don't have a patent on, on that divine intelligence that it moves in and through everything. Our youngsters have it too. And no matter how we preach, anyhow, they have to learn their own way. Even when we know that it, it may not be the best thing for them, sometimes we have to allow them to learn. Another challenging area for many of us is letting go of failed relationships and lost loves. Many people feel nostalgic for, my mother used to call it the good old days, and it, it really was a romantic, uh, made up idea of what the old days were like. Because there were wonderful things about them, but there were things that weren't wonderful either. You know? So I used to say, mom, these are the good new days. You know, and we need to focus on those because the good old days are past and we have to make something of the days we have now. So if you want to have a better sense of where your old unwanted baggage is, where you're storing it, take a look to places where you have the hardest time letting go. Some people have a hard time letting go of money. Others are challenged to let go of their youth, while others cling tenaciously to the belief that they are always right. Many people are challenged to let go of jealousy, bitterness, resentment, and fear, carrying deep negative feelings that gnaw at their very core. But friends, most of us, or for most of us, much of our sadness and our dissatisfaction with life can be traced to our inability to let go. Yet the concept of letting go is espoused by every, and promulgated by every great religious tradition uh, in the world. And all of these traditions recommend that the spiritual seeker should let go of ne the negative and embrace and move forward with something more positive, wholesome, and life-affirming. We let go of destructive physical habits and take up a healthier lifestyle when we let go of the belief that there may not be enough and practice generosity. You can let go of anger and replace it with love. You can let go of that deep hurt and replace it with inclusiveness and compassion. We can let go of envy and replace it with genuine happiness at the good fortune of others. We can let go of judgmental attitudes in favor of more tolerant and open-minded points of view. We can let go of the need to control everything and everyone and learn to relax our tight stranglehold on our perceived reality and to go with the flow of life as it comes. This is a tall order, but I'm saying we can learn to do it. And if we do it in small increments, then it is much easier. So when we practice letting go, our our New Year resolutions become New Year evolutions. We evolve into something greater and better and deeper and more beautiful and more caring and more loving than we have experienced before. Does that make sense? Let us affirm together. Right here and now, I let go and let God. Together? Right here and now, I let go and let God. I let go of fear and lay hold of love. I let go of fear and lay hold of love. I let go of the past and lay hold of the present. I let go of the past and lay hold of the present. I let go of anything that belies my divinity. I let go of anything that belies my divinity and lay hold of the truth about me. Perfect God. Perfect person. Perfect being. perfect being. I let go of doing and delight in being. 
Dr. Ernest Holmes, my friends, who gave the world this great teaching known as the science of mind, writes in the textbook of the same name on page 233, paragraph 4, and I quote, if one would take time once a day at least to let go of all that is not true and lay hold of reality, let go of doubt, distrust, worry, condemnation, fear, and lay hold of life in its expressions of beauty, truth, and wholeness, his mental congestion would be healed." Unquote. So this brings me to your assignment for this week. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is to select a time during your working day to just pause and lay hold of the inner reality. And somebody asked me last week a very interesting question. She said, why do you every Sunday when you give an assignment say, should you decide to undertake it? And the reason I say that is, you have choice. So I cannot stand here and tell you what you should. I can't should you. And you shouldn't should yourself either. Uh, but I can suggest that this may be something that you may want to try. So should you decide to undertake it, does give you the option of saying, Oh, Reverend John, that, that, that doesn't resonate with me. Or, yeah, let me give it a try. So, should you decide to undertake it, I want you to take a spiritual pause that refreshes this week. My friend Sandra Cooper, practitioner Sandra Cooper, sets her, her phone to go off twice a day, I think it is, um, mid-morning and again uh, in the afternoon, as a reminder to just pause and breathe in God to just pause and remind oneself that God is all there is, to let go and let that God presence just hold you close to its everlasting heart and, and strengthen you and refresh you and revitalize you. So it's a wonderful practice. Uh, and whether you set your phone to do it or you just remember to do it at the odd time, I find personally that when I have a routine, it's better for me. So, you know, every day at midday and every day at six o'clock. It works for me better than when I remember. Because sometimes you get so caught up with, with, with doing, as we do every day, rather than the being. So I like the idea of the, of the, the, little, the little buzz on the phone. But the practice of a daily spiritual pause will cleanse your mind and consciousness of old unwanted ideas, feelings of lack, limitation, or unworthiness, and will enable you to let go of states of mind and consciousness that cloud your awareness or interfere with your ability to think and act creatively. And as I was uh, pondering this um, yesterday, I thought, you know, I'm going to suggest Reverend Michael and Reverend Anna and Carol Charlton in our work at the prison, that we also suggest this to um, the, um, the people who are participating in our, in our Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life program. A pause during the day to remind themselves of the truth of who they are. So in addition to letting go, I want you to begin to cultivate the consciousness of always having what you want and require, because it's inside you, it's there already, it, the gift has already been given. So privately nurture the aspirations that you have for 2019. Uh, it is recommended that you don't discuss your, your plans with others who may not be as positive and goal-oriented as you, or who do not share your vision of great possibilities. Purposeless or superficial talking about what you intend to accomplish scatters and dissipates the energy. Instead of talking about what you're going to accomplish, keep track of it and keep track of your progress with daily entries in your journal so that you have a, a long-term objective and you can just at the end of the day or sometime when you have a little time to sit down and say, where am I on my journey towards that dream? What have I done today that... that takes me in that direction. Um, so, so that's one way of, of tracking yourself. Again, those of you who attended our goal setting exercise uh, earlier this month will have been given the 21 day challenge of writing each step of affirmative prayer for three days. Beginning with step one, the recognition step, you would for three days write out all the synonyms for God that come to your mind. The next three days were devoted to step two, unification in which you write who you are as the image likeness of God. In step three, realization, that is the listing of all that your heart desires, again written out for three days. In step four, you deny 
or let go of all that no longer serves you. In step five, you reaffirm your good. In step six, you joyfully give thanks. And in step seven, you release it. You plant that seed in the law, which must fulfill that whereunto you are, you are sending it. So if, if, you, if you were here, you, you have that program. If you weren't here and you're interested, you can speak to any practitioner uh, or minister, and we can walk you through it if you would like some help with that. I'm just saying, friends, that we need to let go of unwanted baggage of the past and begin to attract what you want by imagining, feeling, and believing that you have it and that your mind, which is part of the one mind, can bring it into manifestation. Fenwick Holmes, who was the brother of Ernest Holmes, in a book he co-authored with a, a Japanese uh, a master called Masaharu Taniguchi, and they wrote a book together called The Science of Faith. And I didn't know until I read this that, that there was a branch of science of mind in Tokyo. Uh, and in that book, they give this advice, and I quote, learn to relax, and they put this in big, big, uh, in bold print, let God do it. Believe that it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, as Jesus said. If you can let go your fears, depression, doubt, inferiority, then faith, exaltation, and belief in yourself will automatically grow and express, unquote. The authors tell the story of Satakoma, a Giza girl who was studying art but not showing the desired progress. Her tutor constantly upbraided her for her lack of progress, saying, you are no good. Any of you ever had a teacher who, who, who put you down like that? Um, you, I, I'm glad that's happening. Less and less our teachers are becoming more enlightened. But I remember when I was a kid, uh, one teacher said, <laughs> I see somebody shaking their head, they're still doing it. Uh, um, one teacher said, uh, 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 Mr. Scott, are you going to do French? And I said, no, sir, Spanish. He said, oh, my God, he's going to have to become a bread man. Bread men were people who drove a cart um, delivering bread in the mornings. And I thought, why would I become a bread man? Because I'm not speaking French, you know. Um, thank God that's passed. <laughs> I didn't become a bread man. Although I do feed people spiritual food, yes. So Satakoma... Um, wasn't getting where she wanted to go with, with her studies in art. And then one day, as she was on her way to the tutor's home thinking, I can't do this, uh, maybe I should stop, she, uh, her eye fell upon something written on a blackboard at the entrance to the local branch of Sai Chono Ai, which is Japanese for science of mind. And the sign said, and I quote, it is better to believe you can become something rather than make something of yourself, unquote. It is better to believe you can become something rather than make something of yourself, unquote. As Satakoma stood there, the real meaning of the lines dawned on her, and she thought, these lines can help me. I had become so anxious about success in my art that I had no confidence in myself. I never thought... I can. All along my way of thinking has been, I must do it, but I can't. But here it is written that one had better believe one can rather than wish to do it. Well, I will let go of my old belief that I can't and study today believing that I can." Unquote. Of course, you know the end of that story. She went to her tutor's house and found her lesson much easier. Soon, she was frequently hearing her tutor say, you have done well today, and eventually, she mastered her art. Satakoma's story, my friends, though simple, contains an important lesson you can use in your own life. It is a valuable secret which ought to be known, especially by parents, caregivers, and teachers in bringing up children, in managing one's own business enterprise successfully, and also in spiritual growth, the spiritual growth for which we are aiming. The secret is this. Let go of merely wishing to do it and believe you can do it. Holmes and Tanegu, she write, and I quote, the will says... I am determined to do it. I shall make an effort. I will put up a struggle. But faith says, I believe I can do it. It's a wonderful thing when we learn to believe and depend upon the power within 
rather than upon our own effort, unquote. I will do express his will. I believe I can expresses the power to accomplish. In Philippians 4, verse 13, St. Paul gives us this beautiful affirmation. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And as we know in the science of man, the Christ is not Jesus' last name. The Christ is your father-son, father-daughter relationship that you have with God. So in the second step of treatment, when you unify with God, what you're doing is you're saying, I am one with that one. I am created out of it in its image and likeness. What God is, I am. Let us affirm together, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Together, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can because God in me can. I can because God in me can. I can because God as me can. I to your neighbor say, you can because God in you and God as you can. Namaste. You can because God in you and God as you can. Namaste. You can because God in you and God as you can. In a little book by a woman called um, Eva Verber, um, titled Quiet Talks with the Master, the indwelling presence gives this assurance, and I quote, be very still and soon shall open the heaven of my fullness and such a glory shall fill your days as you have never dreamed. Then shall you know the kingdom of heaven is here now in both the spiritual and objective planes for those who love and serve and fulfill the law. Again I say, peace, quiet, expectant waiting, and it shall come to pass in the twinkling of an eye, the making of all things new for you. End of that quote. Friends, I know for you and yours, the making of all things new. Let's go with the assurance that you need never again be dragged into unwanted habits and experiences. You were born to succeed, and you can, because God in you and God as you can. I believe in you. Namaste.